On June 19, 2012, Civil War historian and author Professor William C. Davis came to the University of Science and Arts of Oklahoma to deliver the keynote address for the inaugural Summer History Lecture. In a presentation titled The Summer of 62, Professor Davis wowed a full house of history enthusiasts in Teata Memorial Auditorium with his rich storytelling and solid scholarship. He was gracious enough to sit down with us for a few minutes before the lecture and provide those who couldn't attend with this sample of the night's presentation. On behalf of the university, I would like to thank you for coming to the campus to kick off our inaugural summer history lecture. Your presentation for tonight's address is titled The Summer of 62. Now, before we talk specifically about 1862 and how it shaped the future course of the war, um, what can you share with us about the years that immediately preceded it? For instance, could you identify a moment in time prior to Lincoln's election that the March to Secession might have been stopped? Uh, the Kansas-Nebraska legislation of 1854-55 had the Missouri Compromise not been repealed and virtually reopened this festering sore about slavery in the territories. That might at least have retarded the advance mm -hmm. of, of this growing sectional controversy in which neither side was speaking to the other, but speaking at it mm -hmm. instead. Uh, I think by 1859, it's probably possible they still could have lumbered on for a while, but after John Brown's attack on Harper's Ferry in October 1859, that really was the fire bell in the night. Mm -hmm. I think it was virtually inevitable there was going to be some kind of a clash after that. Quite a few people lay um, a considerable amount of blame at President Buchanan's feet for trying to essentially placate both sides while satisfying neither. Do you feel like that that was a, a fair assessment or was he just really dealing with circumstances that were... I think we really can't say enough bad about Buchanan. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm joking in a way. No, by 1857 when Buchanan took office, it's highly unlikely that even a very skilled leader mm -hmm. was going to be able to forestall this crisis. Buchanan, generation after generation, has voted the worst president in our history, mm -hmm. and probably deservedly so. But I don't know what he could have done. The indictment of Buchanan is that he didn't try. Mm -hmm. But from the time he took office, he was pretty straightforward about it. He was just hoping he could serve out his term before the crisis hit. Right. Uh, I don't think he really saw or appreciated the depth to which people in the North, and especially this powerful new Republican Party, were opposed to the further spread of slavery. Many of them acknowledged they couldn't do anything about it where it existed. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, was Lincoln's platform in 1860. You know, we have no aim against slavery where the Constitution says we can't touch it. They just wanted to halt the spread of slavery to make any more new slave states. Mm -hmm. Buchanan simply didn't understand why people would object to that. Was there a candidate for the presidential election of 1860 who could have produced a different outcome? <laughs> well, the best known candidates, of course, are Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. who all through the campaign promised, I intend to make, take no action whatever against slavery. And of course, no one in the South believed him. Mm -hmm. Uh, Stephen A. Douglas, was like Buchanan, saw no problems with slavery and really was a bit baffled that people were so upset about it. The other two candidates, uh, John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky and John Bell of uh, Tennessee, got uh, much less play in the press. Bell essentially was a cipher. He didn't figure in the election that much. Breckinridge was a genuine moderate in the middle. He, was, he acknowledged that slavery was an existing fact, but was himself personally opposed to slavery. He was a conservative uh, in the best sense of the term, that, typical of Kentucky mm. and Virginia and all of these border states that had strong emotional ties to the South, but very strong patriotic ties to the North and to the idea of the Union. Had Breckinridge been elected, I think secession would have been forestalled, but that doesn't mean it wouldn't have come again because the festering sore of slavery in the territories mm. was not going to go away. Right. Uh, if it didn't come in 1860, it might well have come in 1864. Mm -hmm. And it could have been worse. The longer that war was delayed, the more military technology advanced. Mm. Costly as it was in blood and treasure then, at least 700,000 lives, a million casualties total. If that war had been fought 20 years later, the casualties could have been incalculable. Speaking of President Lincoln, um, it occurred to me that perhaps more so than any other American president, He's deified to the point that it's difficult to get a sense of the man beneath that mantle of myth. Uh, 
Was his presidency a product of the inevitable march to war? And uh, if it wasn't, what do you think a Lincoln presidency without a civil war might have looked like? <laughs> That's a great question. You're right about the myth part, of course. Uh, and I think most historians admit that, that Link, the Lincoln myth has grown so large. And it's not just an American myth, it's a part of world mythology now. Yeah. Uh, even in the, in, in the heights of the, the power of the Soviet Union, Lincoln was a revered figure in the Soviet Union. Hmm. Um, that the real man is largely lost, we can't separate him from it. Every 10 years or so, historians do a survey on the ranking of the presidents. I mentioned that Buchanan's always dead last. Lincoln is almost always first. And a former colleague of mine actually suggested once that we, Congress should simply declare Lincoln a national god <laughs> and put him in a pantheon and then give mortal presidents a chance to be top for a change. Right. Certainly the war gave Lincoln, uh, not unlike FDR, for instance, war powers in an emergency time to do things like the Emancipation Proclamation by executive fiat mm -hmm. that he might not have been able to, compromise, uh, to accomplish uh, in peacetime in working with a Congress that would have been severely divided. Mm -hmm. It's worth remembering that Lincoln was A, a minority president, he only got 39% of the popular vote, and B, he really ran a coalition in Washington for the first couple of years of his presidency between Republicans and Democrats who were committed to the Union. Uh, in peacetime, those Democrats might not have been willing to coalesce with the Republicans, and Lincoln might not have accomplished very much. Which brings us then to um, the summer of 1862. Uh, what, what are the pivotal events of, of that year and that summer, and how did they shape the future uh, course of the war? There are two ways to look at that, I would say. One is the events themselves within the year 1862, but I think a better answer for the question you're answer, asking is, as you say, how those events in that summer impact the balance of the war and how it's to be fought. The major, the major events are the wounding of General Joseph E. Johnston, then commanding the Confederate Army of Virginia at the Battle of Seven Pines. Johnston's a relatively inadequate commander. The only man at hand to replace him is Robert E. Lee, who until then has been in part a desk soldier. The rise of Robert E. Lee that summer the impact that's going to have is that the war in Virginia and in the East is going to last quite a while mm. because the premier field general of the war has finally got a command. In the West, similarly, General Henry W. Halleck, who'd been the overall top Union commander and woefully inadequate as a field officer, will be transferred to Washington and replaced by the only successful commander out there, a still relatively unknown U.S. Grant who is going to dominate the Union war effort for the time. And it's Grant who will determine how the war is won. On the battlefield itself, of course, it's failure after failure after failure for the Union in Virginia <clears throat> until the fall when Robert E. Lee will be defeated, sort of, in the Battle of Antietam. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a long story, but frankly, I think Lee won the battle because he didn't get wiped off the map. Right. But the impact of that in the Emancipation Proclamation and some minimal diplomatic impact as well are things that will be felt for the balance of the war, but particularly the Emancipation Proclamation, which Lincoln was always going to do anyhow mm -hmm. after that summer. Antietam just decided when he would be able to do it. But that internationally revolutionizes the war by turning it into not just a quest to reassemble the Union, but it's now a humanitarian quest as well, mm -hmm. which has enormous impact in foreign capitals that might until then have felt sympathetic to the Confederacy, but they all opposed slavery. And now Lincoln's put the Union on the side of, of making the black man free. And there's a tremendous um, psychological and morale capital in that. And also the, uh, the damage that the Battle of Antietam did to hopes of European intervention on behalf of the Confederacy, mm -hmm. which were not as decisive as some, I think, as some historians do, but still it was a, an important event. So all of these things are going to continue to have repercussions. And beyond even that, the, the North, the late Shelby Foote, once maintained that the Union fought the war with one hand behind its back, which is not exactly true. But there's no question the Confederacy had every muscle, every sinew completely devoted to the war effort. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't do anything else domestically. 
Lincoln, of course, has the luxury of greater resources and is pushing the Transcontinental Railroad westward. But he does other things that summer, like signing the Morrill Land Grant Act that creates all of our land grant colleges and universities, which may be the single most far-reaching piece of legislation. Just try to add up the achievements and the contributions to world history and culture and the human condition of all of those land grant colleges created by that one act. I think it's incalculable. Mm. So there's a lot going on behind the battlefield in the North that's going to have impact throughout the war and of course for generations to come. Well thank you very much. It's for a your great time. pleasure. I enjoyed thank it. You. Thank you.